May the Samir weapon, a lion with jaws agape, and Kalkal, the doorkeeper of the Akur, protect you. The Star Commander aimed another laser strike at the Shrek as the Pegasus accelerated and made a break for the open hills to the south. The Shrek turned and fired its PPCs at the far end of his point. As an anti-mech weapon, a PPC was devastating. Against highly mobile, armored elementals, the blasts were ineffective. The brilliant bursts of white-tinged blue beams missed their marks, burning the grass around his warriors. The static discharging arcs from the burst danced off the elemental's armor, leaving little black froze on their already charred paint. Battle scars. There are precious few tracked vehicles in the inner sphere that cause as much hesitation and trepidation in mech wearers as the Shrek PPC carrier. While the Demolisher's large autocannon can be tremendously damaging up close, and the Behemoth's sustained fire can burn down a target relentlessly, a Shrek PPC carrier holds a unique position as the go-to tank for cutting down even the largest of battle mechs should they stride into range. While normally tank designers avoided laser weaponry due to the energy required to power them as well as the waste heat they generated, Aldus Industries engineers leaned into it with the Shrek. Already a producer of combat vehicles, the 80-ton Shrek rolled off the assembly lines in 2913, 10 years after the Aldus Demolisher Mark I, and by all accounts it continued to build the company's reputation for powerful, high-quality vehicles. With all the issues that the Demolisher Mark I had with excess heat generation, engineers sought to settle the issue by installing a 240 fusion engine along with 20 additional heat sinks in this design. This allowed the Shrek to fire all of its energy weapons each turn without any heat buildup. Of course, it would be impossible to go very long without discussing those weapons. Three Hellstar particle projection cannons were the pinnacle of energy weapon technology at the time, and the concentrated damage was more than enough to humble heavy and assault battle mechs. The design of the vehicle was optimized to limit exposure to return fire and to allow for effective hull-down firing from defensive positions. One of the major complaints about vehicles with fusion engines at the time, continuing well into later periods, was their cost. Aldus had this in mind as they sought to make the mech as survivable as possible while still making it an offensive powerhouse. With a flank speed of 54 km per hour, the Shrek cannot be confused with a speedy hovercraft, but it is enough to at least escape the heaviest of opponents. Without any secondary weaponry, the crew of the Shrek had to be wary of being overrun by opposing forces seeking to close within the minimum range of the three PPCs. Battlefield commanders were well advised to pair the Shrek with other vehicles or infantry to prevent the expensive tank from being handily defeated by a light mech or hovercraft seeking a quick victory. As a fire support vehicle, the Shrek outperforms in several key ways. The first is the independence from the ammunition supply chains. As glorious as it is to hit mechs with large autocannon rounds or dozens of missiles, the ammunition for those weapons isn't always readily available, especially during a siege situation. So long as the crew inside can function, the Shrek could continue to fire. The second major advantage was the efficient design of the Arc Shield 7 Mark V standard armor plating, which maximized the effectiveness of all seven tons of the mass. Incoming fire at the front of the vehicle that did manage to hit the low-profile Shrek would often be impacting at a very steep angle which increased the number of glancing shots and increased the amount of armor any penetrating rounds would need to pass through in order to reach the soft internal bits of the vehicle. Initial sales of the Shrek were lackluster due to its cost and still relatively novel fusion engine. Most vehicle mechanics at the time were much better versed in the maintenance of internal combustion engines and the comparatively more complex fusion engine led to some reports of Shreks breaking down in the field due to shoddy or inexperienced repairs. It wasn't until the early 31st century that the sales of the Shrek moved beyond well-funded military organizations. However, where the Shrek was found in those militaries of the succession wars, it was a cherished asset and a vehicle to fear. Closer to home, the Shrek is still a favorite. Compared to the AWS 8Q Awesome, the Shrek has a 34% wider field of fire and equivalent speed. Though the Shrek mounts only 7.5 tons of armor, its smaller size gives it more kilograms of armor per square meter than the Awesome, all for less than 60% of the Awesome's price tag, making it quite attractive to cost-conscious commands. Variants of the Shrek's loadout were few and far between for quite a while. 
The most common aftermarket modification was the addition of small arms or light machine guns to the hull to give the tank some ability to protect itself when an enemy was within the minimum range of the PPCs. In 2833, there was an anti-infantry variant produced which added two machine guns to the turret of the tank along with a half ton of ammunition, though it came at the cost of armor. Having just 5.5 tons of plate which provided 88 points of protection was a tough trade-off for a couple of mech grade machine guns, so this variant really was never very popular. One of the more abominable variants of the Shrek surfaced in 2916 and exists only because of the widespread shortages of weapons like the PPC and equipment like heat sinks. Victim of scavenging house units, the valuable Hellstar PPCs were often pulled from the tank, leaving it bereft of offensive weaponry. What became known as the Shrek autocannon carrier was an attempt to at least give them some purpose. The fusion engine was also pulled in exchange for a standard ice, and instead of three PPCs, the Shrek was armed with a trio of AC-5 autocannons, along with three tons of ammunition. As a consolation prize, it was also given two extra tons of armor and eight machine guns, distributed around the hull of the turret. The final result was a tank that had its possible offensive damage halved in exchange for making it slightly more survivable in close combat. Now, I'm not a big fan of this Shrek, but I do know there are some out there who like it. Those people are dangerous and should be reported to the authorities when you encounter them in the wild. You have been warned. In 3072, an up-armored variant sought to take advantage of the new heavy ferrofibrous armor technology to boost the strength of the Shrek. Seven tons provided 138 points of armored protection, which was a nice boost from the original Shrek's 112. The three PPCs from the original loadout are retained. The Shrek armor variant is a very modest upgrade, but it is an appreciated one. Having 38 points of armor on the front of the vehicle is definitely an improvement over the original's 24. It's definitely worth giving it a try. The next significant variant of the Shrek would hit the battlefields of the Blakest Kerfuffle in 3076. The Shrek C3M is reminiscent of the original, but it has five fewer heat sinks as a result of one of the PPCs being replaced with the light version and having an extra half ton of armor, bringing the total to 7.5 tons. In addition to the light PPC, the C3M has a C3 computer, two anti-missile systems, and an ECM suite, making the vehicle a pretty advanced one in comparison to the original. Having an improved chance to hit with a good functioning C3 network up and running is always tantalizing when firing from afar. Giving up that 5 damage for these bells and whistles could be worth it if you're running a C3 network, though if not, there are probably better options out there. In another example of periphery downgraded tech, the Lothian League's domestic production of the Shrek lacked the PPCs and the fusion engine. In their place was an internal combustion engine and three Ultra AC-10 autocannons, along with 60 shots worth of ammunition. It is also protected by seven tons of ferrofibrous armor. This variant provides the opportunity to do up to 60 points of damage in a turn, which is really nice, though it does come with the ammunition limitations and the chance to jam those UACs. It's going to boil down to risk versus reward on this one. In addition to being one of the major producers of the original three PPC Shrek, new Samarkand metals also produced a variant of the tank intended to act as an anti-aircraft platform. Taking inspiration from the 90-ton Narukami heavy tank, the new Shrek was protected by 14 tons of hardened armor. Now don't let the paper doll on this one fool you, as each point of hardened armor requires two points of damage to mark off. For the anti-air component of the loadout, two of the PPCs were removed in favor of an addition of two LB-10X autocannons. As it turns out, when you start pulling those energy weapons and their matching heat sinks, quite a bit of mass is freed up. Having 10 tons of each ammo type for each LB-10X was acceptable for defensive operations near logistics lines, but a slight concern for longer campaigns. Overall, I like it. Keeping one PPC was a good idea to remind everyone of the tank's origins. Now for our next variant, the Shrek finally sees an attempt with an XL engine upgrade, which comes with a corresponding price increase. To keep the tank safe, it also had seven tons of heavy ferrofibrous armor. The engine upgrade was not in service of improved weaponry as the three PPCs remain untouched. Instead, the engine itself is more powerful, able to improve the tank's movement speed to a 4-6 profile. This speedier Shrek could do a better job of supporting advances and avoiding being cut off under shifting battlefield conditions. It's decently armored and can take some hits, though still suffers from the original tank's lack of close-range weaponry. 
pair this up with a buddy before battle. Our next to last official variant was designed for the Capellan Confederation and the Duchy of Andurian with the intent of upgrading the Shrek to a stealthy Gauss rifle platform. With stealth armor and a Guardian ECM suite installed, the Shrek Gauss carrier's goal is to avoid being seen on enemy scanners, firing at a target from extreme range, and then avoiding any return fire by fleeing the area. What the three light Gauss rifles lack in power they make up for with range, still doing 8 damage out to 25 hexes. Word is the stealth Shrek Gauss carrier has been deployed to the Capellans to their border with the Davions, and the Andorians have done the same on their border with the Free Worlds League. It's hard to tell, you know, because of the whole stealth thing. If you hear three sharp thunderclaps and the mech next to you explodes, that might be a good hint that something's going on. So now here we are, near the end of our incredible Shrek journey. We didn't save any princess or fight a dragon, and there was no wisecracking donkey. However, we do have one more interesting take on the PPC carrier concept. This experimental design, known as the Shrek 2X, has comes to us from the fine people at Ark Royal Mechworks and the supervising technician Vanessa Bidwell. This updated Shrek, created in 3076, shares little with the original tank beyond a general appearance. It's 15 tons heavier, it's powered by a 285XXL fusion engine, carries 35 heat sinks, and is protected by 8.5 tons of heavy ferrofibrous armor. Of course, the most notable upgrade to the design was the swap from the three standard PPCs to six light PPCs, three of which were paired with PPC capacitors. All six were also tied to a targeting computer for improved accuracy. If you went to public school like I did, you might need some help with the math there, so let's do it real quick. Six light PPCs, that's five damage apiece, that's 30. However, with the PPC capacitors in play, that's an additional 15 damage, giving us a total possible damage of 45 worth of PPC shots out to 18 hexes. That is a considerable amount of fire each turn without any ammunition or heat concerns. The downside for the Shrek 2X is that it's incredibly expensive. Between the XXL fusion engine, the PPC capacitors, and the heavy ferrofibrous armor, you could buy a Clan Tech battle mech with the equivalent or better performance. It's the reason why it's unlikely the Shrek 2X ever made it past the testing phase. Now I think we definitely need a totally unofficial mech frog variant just for fun. I think you're going to be shocked by the direction I took in upgrading our friend the Shrek for the ill clan audiences. To buy mass for our master plan, I had to upgrade to an XL engine and swap the standard armor for 9 tons of light ferrofibrous. The movement profile from the tank hasn't changed. In the turret, I've added three plasma rifles along with six tons of ammunition in the body of the vehicle. Their ability to do 10 damage per shot matches the original PPCs, but with the plasma technology, it also adds additional heat to the target. With mechs running around these days with heavy PPCs and boating ER large lasers, it's nice to throw a wrench into their works with some additional unexpected heat. For up close conflict resolution, I've added seven machine guns, two in the turret, one on each side, one facing the rear arc, and two in the front. That should keep the infantry from getting too close if the plasma rifles aren't enough of a deterrent. 20 shots per rifle should be enough for most battles, though ammunition is a drawback from the original loadout. Overall, I think the Shrek MF would do well as part of a lance of standard Shreks or as a standoff defensive platform. The possibility of adding up to 18 unexpected heat to a mech should give any mech warrior pause. So if we wrap up here, I'm pondering why the Shrek holds a special place in the hearts of Battletech fans. I think it boils down to the simple fact that we like the idea of hitting things with bolts of lightning. The prospect of doing so three times every turn only compounds that enjoyment. The Shrek is a solid tank that sacrifices a bit of speed and armor in exchange for additional firepower. If you treat it right and keep it protected, it will be a quality producer. If you ignore it as a foe, you do so at your peril. That is why we love the Shrek. Thank you as always for coming out today to talk some Battletech. If you feel the video is worthwhile, hitting that like and subscribe button makes it easy and much more likely that you'll see my nonsense in the future. It also feeds my insatiable hunger for positive affirmation. Win-win, right? Taking the extra step to become a channel member more directly helps make sure that Battletech nonsense can keep flowing. An additional thank you for those who have already done so. Until we meet again, take care and go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.